Hey everyone, I'm going to go ahead and get started. This is old Dr. H, and we would love to have you come and, and be a part of our study on the book of Revelation. And boy, are we in some, uh, into, we're going to have a really good time tonight. In fact, I hope you'll go back to our website at lyitl.org. That's loveyouinthelord.org forward slash Revelation, and that's our whole entire Revelation series. So if you didn't get a chance to get on here early and get caught up, you can always go back and review and share with those that you love and care about. So we're in Revelation chapter 3, part number 2, and we're going to be learning some really specific things. Uh, we've already talked about the church of Ephesus, the church of uh, Smyrna, uh, the church of Thyatira, and then the church of Sardis last week. Now we're going to be looking in Revelation chapter 3, uh, starting in verse number 7. This is going to be the message to the church of Philadelphia. That, and uh, he's going to be talking about the true church and the professing church. And it's very important because there's going to be kind of a twist here tonight. And I think you're going to find it very amazing. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, And the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things said he that is holy, he that is true. Once again, this is about a church that's set aside trying to uh, uh, live for the Lord Jesus Christ, one that believes in the Word of God. These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that, here it is, has the key of David. We'll talk about that. That he that openeth and that no man shutteth, and, and he says, and no man openeth. So Revelation chapter 3, this is part Number two, let's continue to read in verse no, number eight, as he says in Revelation chapter three, I know thy works and behold, I have set before thee, here it is, an open door. That's a key, underline that. And no man shut it. That's another key, right? You know, I want you to circle that. For thou hast little strength. So he's talking about this church of Philadelphia. He says they're small. They've got little resources. They've got little strength and everything. But they're, but they're hanging on to the word of God. These are true believers. These are not the fake ones. These are the true ones. And he says, For thou hast a little strength, hast kept my word. There it is, kept my word, and has not denied my name. Verse 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. Now, we, we've talked about the synagogue of Satan in the last couple of sermons, but tonight we're going to wrap it in a nutshell. You'll understand what I'm talking about. In verse number 9 of Revelation chapter 3, he says, uh, he says, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Why? Verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will what? Look at this. This is interesting. He says, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, underline this, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, uh, a lot of people try to think that that hour is something that is the whole tribulation, and it's not. But I'll show you some things. So the church is sometimes thought to be uh, the, the missionary church. That's what the, the Philadelphia church was. It's been known as the, the church that was faithful, that, that witnessed, and they, they kept the word of God, the name of God. They kept themselves for God. And I believe if, we're, if we take a careful look tonight at this particular church, that we'll be able to see maybe even our churches today that are faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. The church would be strong and active in the gifts of the Spirit. We talked about that last week. But they would be teaching holiness. And they would be teaching living right, righteousness. They would not be tolerant to compromise. They would not be any, it wouldn't be a denominational, but more rather grounded in Jesus Christ. So here we find this church taught by the Holy Spirit of God. This church would be promoting the Spirit rather than bringing the world into the church. Let me say it again. This church in Revelation chapter 3 was more about the Spirit of God being in them than trying to bring the world into the church. So he says in Revelation 3, 7, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, 
Now watch. These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David. He's talking about Jesus Christ. He that openeth, talking about Jesus Christ, and no man shutteth. So if Christ opens it, nobody can shut it. And he says, and no man opens it. So you can't open. Uh, in fact, if you go back and read Revelation chapter 1, uh, whenever John said he got a vision of Jesus, he said he was the Alpha, the Omega, and he had the keys. The keys. Only Christ can open the door and Christ can lock the door, right? No man has that power. Only Christ has it. That's important. So this was known as the missionary church. And the city of Philadelphia was about 25 miles southeast of Sardis that we talked about last week. And it was on about an 800 foot open rise. So to this church, which Christ says has little strength, the Lord comes to open an avenue of opportunity that no force in hell can shut. Why? Jesus is now going to pronounce his authority. And I believe we're living in that day also that I believe there's going to be some doors that, that Jesus is going to open. And I believe there's going to be some doors he's going to shut. And I believe that, that, that all hell will not be able to prevail against uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So here we find that, that possessing the key of David means that he has the authority. Are you ready for this? To open all the supernatural doors and to close all of the demonic doors. So in uh, Romans chapter 2, verses 28 through 29. Now listen, he says in the book of Romans, the same thing we're talking about here in Revelation chapter 3. Watch this. He says in Romans chapter 2, verse 28 through 29, for he is not a Jew, which, uh, uh, which is one outwardly, neither is that, uh, that circumcision which is outwardly in the flesh. Now watch what he says. But he is a Jew. He said, he's telling you what, what you have to do to be a Jew. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God. Now you have to understand that a lot of the Jewish people of that day, uh, they, they, were, they were all about the keeping of the law, they were all about the circumcision of the flesh. And yet he tells us once again in Romans chapter 2, let me read again for you, verses 28 uh, through 29. For he is not a Jew, which is one that is outwardly or of the flesh, neither is that of circumcision, talking about fleshly circumcision. He said, that doesn't make you a Jew. Uh, he says this, he says, which is of the flesh. But he says, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly now. And he says, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men, but of God. That's important. So Jesus shows himself to the church at Philadelphia in the very same, uh, in a way that, that they would want to worship him. So here is, we know that Jesus is holy. Now, let's go back to the book of Leviticus. Now, Jesus tells us to be holy even as he is holy. In Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44, For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, he says, But as, uh, as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. So it, what does he do? Jesus shows himself here as truth. In fact, John 14, 6, we've talked before. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is the one that opens the door to heaven. Or he opens the door to hell. He has that authority. Jesus is the door to heaven. He's the only one who can shut or open either door, whether it be heaven or hell. He took the keys in Revelation chapter 1, the key of hell, away from Satan, away from the devil. And when Jesus went there and, 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 and he went on, on the... And he died on the cross of Calvary, and the Bible says he went he went down into Hades, and there he he, he uh, uh, talked to you know, to everyone there, and yet on the third day he arose and led the captive free. We'll get into this a lot later, but listen, he took the keys when he was there away from from the authority that bound people there, and so Jesus is the final judge. 
for everyone's resting place. So here's Jesus. He goes to hell and everybody that's in hell sees that he's the final judge. Everybody in paradise sees that he is the final judge and the final rewarder. Okay, so here we find that, that uh, the church in Philadelphia, it is sim- it's a symbolic church even today, are not only aware of, of who Jesus is, but they are pattering their lives after him. That's why they're called followers of Jesus, not people who just go to church, not just people who just go around trying to do good. Those are good things, but these are actual followers of Jesus Christ. They are the very elect. They are full of the words, so full that it would be terrible, to, uh, terribly difficult to even deceive them. But there's going to be a lot of people in the days to come that, uh, you know, they're we're church goers. We're uh, people that we sing, maybe in the choir. We, we do all kinds of things. But the fact is, is that there is a false group. Now listen, you talk about a true group and a false group of believers, a true group of followers and a false group of followers. So Jesus shows himself as truth. And, and, and he says, these are the very elect. They're not going to be, they're not going to be deceived like the ones that are, that are pretending to be saved. They're pretending to, to be followers of Jesus Christ. So God promised these believers that are true believers that he will keep them, listen, from that hour of temptation. And he says that hour of temptation is going to come upon the whole world. So I want you to note that the event spoken of here is a definite time period, the hour. And it doesn't mean that it's, it's 60 minutes. It means there's a time slot. And notice, when does this hour, what's it referring to? Number two, it's a period of trials. Trials like nobody's ever seen on this earth before. Number three, John, think about this. He's writing about the future event. So number one, it's definitely a time period. Number two, it's a period of trial. Number three, it's in the future. Number four, it was worldwide, or it will be worldwide. The promise in the Greek was to keep thee out of. Let me say it again. To keep thee out of the hour. So the the facts make it evident that the event refers to the great tribulation that is described in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew, the book of Matthew is full of, of, uh, when we talk about revelation, people say, I'm scared to read revelation. Oh my gosh, you guys said, I'll bless you if you read it out loud. But in Matthew, there's a lot of prophecy. Look what he says in in Matthew chapter 24, look in verse number 15. Now, I know that that, uh, you're watching this uh, maybe by Facebook or YouTube or you're watching it online. That's a nice thing. Today, we can go back and rewind and get everything that we're talking about. But in Revelation chapter 24, because we're talking about the danger of failing to advance. That's really what we're talking about today. So he says this in Matthew chapter 24, verse number 15. 15. Listen carefully. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. And I'll talk about this probably next week quite a bit. But you know, so whenever, uh, uh, whenever you have this satanic rule that comes in, it destroys, uh, you know, the Jewish way of, of worshiping. They, they set themselves up in, in, in the middle of the tribulation. And then they, they make everybody, you know, want to worship him. So you've got three and a half years at the beginning of the tribulation. And then you've got three and a half years of the great tribulation, which is a total of 42 and a half months, 42 and a half months, or three and a half, three and a half years. But right in the middle of that, then he says the last part is the hour. And we'll get the, we'll get into this right here. Now watch carefully. Ready? He says uh, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15 through 22. Let's pick back up on this right here. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by the Daniel the prophet, stand in that holy place, who so readeth, let him understand. Then he says in verse 16, Then let them which be in Judea flee unto into the mountains. Let 
him which is of the housetop not come down to take anything out of the house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. He says, but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, uh, uh, neither on the Sabbath day. Now watch this right here. And he says this, verse 21 and 22 of Matthew. He says, for then shall be a great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor, nor, he says, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened. He's talking about the, not just the beginning of the tribulation, but the last part of it. He said, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, here it is, those days shall be shortened. So when we're looking at this, these believers at Philadelphia who have really only a little strength have nevertheless, they've kept God's word. They have not denied his name. And so God's going to give them a promise. God promises that they will become the pillars in the temple of God. Revelation 3, 2. Let's go back to Revelation. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of God, the name of the city. We're going to talk about this. The name of God, the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from God, and I will write upon him my new name. So the church may have been small in number in that day, maybe small in material resources, but God's going to make them strong. They are promised an open door. Now in scriptures, an open door refers to Christ. In fact, he says in John chapter 10, verse 7, Then said Jesus unto, uh, uh, unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. You see, not only is he the open door, but he's going to open uh, the gospel to preach the gospel. In Acts chapter 5, verse 19 through 20, if you remember, he says, But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go and stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Did you get that? He's referring back when the apostle Paul was in prison and, and God came down that day uh, and with the power and the authority and God opened those doors so they could go out in the temple and, and, and teach the words of this life. And so when you think about the rapture of the church in Revelation chapter 4, now God's going to talk about uh, in Revelation chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4 in reference to the church ages. But in Revelation chapter 4, he's going to talk about a door in verse 4. He says, Revelation 4, he says, For after this I looked, and behold, here it is. We're talking about that door was open. Remember Christ has the keys to open doors, shut doors, to let people out of something or put people into something and lock them up. He says in Revelation 4, 4, And after this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet. Uh, uh, and, and he says, talking with me. And he says, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter or to come. So each of these may be interpreted as an open door. It's a promise to the church, even, even as, as each can be applied even to the church today. So in these end times, God is opening, I believe, many tremendous doors of opportunity for you and I to come out of our prisons, in a sense, and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ like we've never preached it before. So in these, in these end times, these tremendous doors of opportunity, and here we have one tonight. You know, there are some churches, they deliver maybe a message on a Sunday. Hey, we're still, we're preaching at 11 o'clock on Sunday, uh, 6 o'clock Sunday night, Wednesday night at 7.30. What an opportunity to preach more to more people than just a few people in a church. We can preach to the multitudes now because of the technology. 
And you may feel that you, you have, like this church, very little strength. But God can make you strong. He can make you, like he said, a pillar in his kingdom and a spiritual warrior who is able to walk through every door that God opens. So let me ask you, what is holding you back from going through the doors that God's trying to open with you, though, even those supernatural spiritual doors? What's holding you back from fulfilling God's call for your life? Is it fear? Is it your finances? Is it your health? Is it your relationships maybe with others? But God has set before you an open door which no man can shut. And I want to get that to you tonight. All the demons of hell cannot shut the doors that Christ opens. He's going to open some supernatural doors in these last days. All hell is going to come against it, but it won't be able to stop what Christ is going to do. In fact, Jesus is the way. And, and, and all you must do is walk through those doors in the almighty power of God. Not in the almighty power of a denominational name, but in the actual power and presence of God. Revelation 3, 8 says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Jesus is aware of everything that the churches are doing today. You say churches. We're all that church. He's aware of, of, of what's in your heart. He's aware of what, what you're willing to do or whether or not you're allowing sin to come in and keep you from living for God. And, and he, he has firsthand knowledge because, you know what, he, he lives in the church. He lives in you. He knows your thoughts. He knows your heart and he knows your intentions. So Jesus is the door and has provided himself for us to go through that door to heaven. The door that Jesus opens can only be closed by him. So Jesus cares for his own. And it's very interesting here that he says that this church has little strength. And this is absolutely true, even of all strong believers today. In our weakness, Jesus makes us strong. The strength that sustains us and sees us through everything that we're having to go through today is his and his alone. When we say I can do all things through Christ, which what? Strengthens me. Hey, listen, I can't get through this thing on my own. I need the power and the authority of the presence of God in my life to get through even today. So in our weakness, Jesus makes us strong. Why? Because he's strong. This, this particular good statement that Jesus makes about the church is, is that they have kept his word. I challenge you in these days, get your Bible off the shelf. Don't leave it on the couch. Get that thing out and start reading it. And I want you to learn it, memorize it, be a part of it, and let get the Word of God in you so that when the time comes, you can get the Word of God out to people that are willing to listen. If we change the Word of God in any way, the instructions won't work. The Bible is our instruction book for living a life that's not only pleasing to God, but fulfilling to you. But many have watered down the Word of God. We talked about that last week. Many have watered down the Word of God until it has been short-circuited and lost its power. The church mentioned here uh, might have been small in size, but they were big in love and they had the power of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit in them, on them, and it worked through them to make a presence in a world that was demonic around them. The church mentioned here, like I said, again, uh, uh, many will one day deny Jesus Christ. In fact, many are already doing that even now. And yet they call themselves a church or they call themselves a follower of Christ. But when you, when, like the old saying, when the tire hits the pavement, you're going to know. In fact, he says in Matthew, he said there's going to be the sheep and then there's going to be the wolves. And he said, you're going to, he said, I know the difference, right? But let me explain something. He talked about the seed of Satan. Now, this is important. This is where the last two sermons, this is the, the part three, uh, chapter three, part two. Let me put this, the seed of Satan in a nutshell. All right, Revelation 3, 9. And I, it's very important, this is very important that you want to listen to this. Revelation 3, 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. 
Did you get that? Not just the seat, but the synagogue of Satan, which say that they are Jews and they are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. This is important. Please listen to what I'm about to say. Now listen, there is no difference, really, in someone who follows Satan and someone who pretends to be a Christian. And they're not. Why? Because they're both lost. And there's a lot of people who are putting their faith in because they go to church. They put their faith in something that, that, that it, it has no, no real power. So he says in Revelation 3, 9, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. And they say they're Jews and they are not. So let me kind of bring up. There are people that say they're a Christian, but they're, they're not. They say they're a believer, but they're not. They're just clothed with some form of religion, not a relationship. And so really there is no difference really in someone who follows Satan or someone who pretends to be a Christian and and they're not a Christian. Why? Because they're both lost. They don't have the indwelling of God. They don't have, they're not covered by the blood of the Lamb. So the synagogue of Satan is just a place of worship where God is not Lord. Let me say it again. The synagogue of Satan is just a place of worship where God is not put in the place as Lord. You know, a Jewish synagogue could be of Satan if it, if, if it was just, if you just look at the evil that's around it. Why, I, don't, I know it's going to make some people mad. But sometimes even the local Christian church today here that we have in the United States and around the world, you know, it, it, it's pretty much no different than the synagogue of Satan. Why? Because if the true word of God is not taught and received and, and, and allowed to impact your life, then what we've got, we have, some people call it a worship center. But is it a center that worships God? Is it a place where when you walk in, uh, it's like he told uh, in the Old Testament, take your shoes off, you're on holy ground. But most of the time, our churches, we don't see that when we walk in as being God's place. And so the church which does not compromise and prevails unto the end. Listen, the Bible says if you don't, during that tribulation period, if you don't compromise and you prevail to the end, you're going to reign with Christ. So Jesus is just encouraging this church here in Revelation to keep on keeping on. Why? Because he said, there's going to come a day I'm going to bring a reward to you. Ladies and gentlemen, God's going to reward the Christian. He will reward us for remaining faithful and true to him and doing what we can, like he said, as he released them out of prison. Tell them about the life. Tell them about the gospel. So the Christians, the Bible says, will rule over those who have rejected Jesus for a thousand years on the earth. And we will, uh, you'll, we'll read about this in Revelation to come, right? But Jesus loves people, but he loves people that are saved too. And he loves people that are faithful, all right? And, and so here, here uh, he says, uh, he that has an ear, and he said, let them hear. So in Revelation 3.10, he says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will keep, look at this, look at this, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the earth to try them, to try them that dwell upon the earth. This verse repre- uh, presents a promise. Out beside verse 3.10, write the word promise. He, he says, and he says, this verse uh, represents a promise that Christ will rapture, listen, only genuine believers out during that tribulation time. The hour of temptation. This is a period of worldwide testing. The Greek word is, I'll spell it to you, and it's parasmos, which is P-E-I-R-A-S-M-O-S, which has not yet to come, right? Because in Daniel chapter 12, watch carefully. In Daniel chapter 12, it's in verse 1, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was seen, uh, since there was a nation even to that t- same time. And at that time uh, thy people shall be what? Underline Delivered. Everyone, what? Everyone that shall be found written in the book. It's a promise. 
Matthew 24, 21. For then shall be a great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world uh, to this time. No, nor even shall be. Verse 29 of Matthew 24 says, Immediately, listen, after the tribulation of those days, did y'all catch that or was it just me? After the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shake, shaken. So Christ promises to keep them from. Now the Greek, it's called ek, ik, right? Means out of. And he says, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna promise to keep them out of that tribulation period. That is, that they will not enter into that period of history. So the tribulation is for the purpose of trying and, and, and of judging. Judging who? Them that dwell upon the earth, the Bible said. Those who are connected to the earth and its system and not connected to God. So believers are not even included in that term. In fact, in Philippians chapter 3, you've got to mark this down, verses 18 through 20, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Did you get that? They are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who, who mind earthly things, for our conversation is in heaven. From whenceforth also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So once again, now we can go back and look at 1 Peter 2.11, Revelation 6, uh, verse 10, Revelation 11.10, Revelation 13.8, and 12 and 14, and Revelation 17.18, and all these references to back up what we just said. Trials, tribulations, and temptations, they come to all of us, right? But it seems that the group that's mentioned here have already been tested and already found to stand in their temptation. There's a time of testing. There's a time of victory. And if you don't overcome, there'll be a time of defeat. So Jesus was tempted 40 days and 40 nights, but he came out victorious. When trials come, we can do one of two things. We can stand against the temptation, rebuke that temptation, and experience victory, or we can take the easy way out and just give in to that temptation and fall into defeat. So listen, if you, as, as we clo start closing this down, what Christ is saying is that if you are a Christian, a true believer, and if, if, if temptation comes against you and you, you don't get victory over it, that same temptation is going to rule you. Paul said, I, he said, I, I looked at my life and he said, I found, I found a, 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 a law that sin reigns in my mortal body. He said, I have to beat my body into subjection because if he didn't take the authority over that temptation, that temptation was going to be with him from, for, for, for the rest of his life. And so if you're a Christian and if the temptation wins, then you will go through that temptation over and over and over again until you stand against it, until you overcome it, until you get victory over that temptation, you're going to struggle with it. That's why we're weak. That's why we need the presence of God in our life. It appears that this group in Revelation here, mentioned here in Revelation chapter 3, they stood against those temptations. So their promise from Jesus is that they will not be required to go through the great tribulation. And we'll talk about this in the next coming weeks. There is a time specified of God when the temptations, the tribulations, and the trials will become so great It'll be almost impossible to stand, especially, especially if you're trying to go through them on your own, right? Then hour, let's close this down. An hour with God can be any specific time. God's time and our time, it's, it's, it's not the same. So this hour mentioned here certainly does not mean 60 minutes. It means a period of time. And we talked about the great, about the tribulation. 
You know, and I, I, when the church, we'll talk about when the church is raptured out and, and how the, that, that, that's when it begins. In the first three and a half years, there's peace and promise of peace. But then there's a desolation of abomination when the Antichrist comes in. And he just tears up all of Israel. He tears up their, their Jewish temple and, and, and he, get, he puts out mock worship and, and, and forces you to you know, follow him or die. And then all of a sudden, the last hour, the last three and a half years, the last 42 and a half months, there's going to be some judgments that comes down. And, you know, I tell people, that's God's way of saying, you want a world without God? I'll show you a world without God. But then God puts his judgments there. And it's still God's way of trying to turn people back to him before time runs out. And so God's promised the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ that we'll be saved from the wrath to come. Now, here, I believe this is the case. Temptation here, I believe, is the same as tribulation. So, Revelation 7, 9. After this, I behold. Revelation 7, 9. After this, I behold, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues or languages, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, listen, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And in Revelation chapter 7, verse 13 through 14, and one of the elders answered, said unto me, what are, these, uh, you know, uh, what are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? Verse 14 says, And I said to him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they, listen, which came out of the great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white. Oh, here it is. In the blood of the Lamb. Listen, before the tribulation takes place, it's the blood of the Lamb that saves us from our sin. In the tribulation, it's going to be the blood of the Lamb. But God's going to allow people during the tribulation to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Their robes will be made white and they will be washed by the blood of the Lamb. And this is so important. It tells us that the Christians who were saved from that unbearable temptation at the end of three and a half years of tribulation. Now, what does that mean? Let me help you out. Let me close it out. We're in the church age. We're going to see some pre-tribulation uh, heartache, as we're seeing now. Pestilences, heartaches, and, and the evil that's around us. You're going to see things happening that's going to try to discourage you and knock you out. Listen, you started out okay. You started out on fire for God, but boy, the devil's going to come after you. He's going to try and knock the wind out of you. Why? Hey, all it took was not having toilet paper for some people, and I'm not making fun. I want you to think about that for a moment. Listen, our God is bigger than, 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 than uh, our provisions. He's our God. But here's what's going to happen. During, during the tribulation period, seven years, I'm just going to cut to it, they get to the end, and there's going to be the Battle of Armageddon. And at the Battle of Armageddon, there, there's going to be a time like you've never seen. Christ is going to come back. He's going to bring those that he's already raptured out and took with him. they got to get there somehow. He can't bring an empty place back. That's why he, that he raptures the church out, takes them back, brings them back as warriors riding on horses to, with authority and power, and they're going to rule over this world. And during that 1,000-year reign of Christ on this earth, Many, many will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. They'll put their faith in Him the same way you and I did. They'll trust in the same blood that was shed on Calvary as you and I did. In fact, in Revelation 7, uh, 9, he says, After this, behold, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, of kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Revelation 7, 13 through 14, I repeat. He says this, And one of the elders answered, said to me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And he said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which, listen, that came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Listen, God's going to be winning souls today and all through the tribulation, and these are those who got saved. He's going to bring them out. And the Bible says, talks about the great white throne judgment, that, that all the saved are going to be fled away. They're not going to be part of that judgment. But the lost, those that did not trust Christ, those that did not have their robes washed, those that did not believe in the blood of the Lamb, 
They will stand before the judgment of God. They've already experienced some of the judgment of God on the earth, but now they're going to experience the judgment of God just on them and for all eternity. And it talks about, go back and read the last book of Revelation. It says, small and great stood before the Lord. And they were judged according out of the books, out of, out of the, the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, and also that book of your life. And they were judged according to their works. And then they were casted out into outer darkness. Let me tell you, God's in the, in the soul-saving business, and he'll save you tonight if you let him. Listen, don't, don't be one of those that hardens your heart. Don't be one of those that says, I'm going to play around with this thing. Listen, everybody dies. I don't care who you are. We were all born, we live, and we'll die. But always in this way. You know, the thief on the cross was about to die. So was the other thief. But one of them mocked Jesus. And In fact, at first they both mocked Jesus, but all of a sudden conviction came into that thief. And that thief looked at him and said, and to the other thief and said, do you not understand? We're guilty. We're sinful. We, we deserve this. We're going to die. Do you not get this? And then he looked at Jesus. And Jesus, while he was paying for your sins and my sins, he looked over at that thief. He pulled against those nails. Face, his beard's plucked out. Crown of thorns. In fact, the Bible says he looked like a beast. Not this pretty picture that we put in our churches. He paid a price. And he pulled. Swollen eyes. I'm not trying to be gross. I'm just trying. I want you to get the reality. This is a God that literally gave his life, paid for your sin debt. And he looked at that thief and said, you know what? The thief said, would you remember me? And he said, today. He gave a promise. If you'll put your faith in me, when we get through all this, I'm going to give you something so great that, oh my gosh, even your mind can't handle it. I'm going to take you to paradise with me. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a simple it's either life with God or life without God. And through Jesus Christ, we can have life with God. Will you take him at his word? Will you open your heart to the heart that he's opened to you? The Bible says he, he died for the sins of the whole world. That's you and me. He died for the, every rotten person you could ever put in your mind. He died for them. It was not his will that any should perish. Please take him as your savior. You say, how do I do that? You ask him like the thief on the cross. Something maybe like this. Dear Lord, I am guilty, just like the thief said. But I believe you died for me. You shed your blood for me. You arose on the third day. You are alive today. So I'm going to ask you to remember me. I accept you as my Savior. I trust in only you. Give me a home in heaven with you when I die. Allow your Holy Spirit to come into me now. Fill me with your presence. Help me to be a witness and to be full of life and light in the days that I have left. I want to bring glory to your name. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving me, saving me, and writing my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. In Jesus' name, I trust and I say thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hugs and kisses in Jesus' name. Amen. Hope and pray you prayed that prayer. And for those of you I see popping up here, thank you for encouraging me to preach. And just and please pray, pray, pray that, that people will see God, not me, not a denomination, but God through his blessed book. I love you all. Hugs and kisses. Bye-bye.